Hello, my name is Marvin Penner, and I'm the District Superintendent in the Alberta Parkland District of the Evangelical Free Church of Canada. I'd like to share a few thoughts with you today from the Book of Colossians. But before I do that, let's take a brief look at the Evangelical Free Church and, uh, and the Alberta Parkland District. Here's my wife, Colleen, and I. Intro to the Evangelical Free Church of Canada. We exist to share Jesus Christ and to join him in his work of transforming lives. To become a growing network to carry out the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. In essentials unity, in non-essentials charity, in all things Jesus Christ. We focus on three areas, leadership, identity, and mission. Two missionary arms, serve Canada and serve beyond. Serve Beyond, 50 missionaries, diverse ministries, and a benevolence fund. Serve Canada, 150 churches, 12 languages, 5 church plants. There's various districts within the Evangelical Free Church of Canada. There's the Lower Pacific District. There's the Canadian Pacific District. There's the Prairie District. the Central District, and the Alberta Parkland District, of which we are a part. Here's a map that shows you where the churches are in the Alberta Parkland District. That gives you a little bit of an idea about who we are and uh, what we're doing here together. A few weeks ago, I was reading in the book of Colossians, and I came to the end of the first chapter, Colossians uh, for chapter 1, verse 24, and a few verses into the second chapter, up to verse 5, and uh, I came across that verse in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, that that is really, I've always struggled to understand. To be honest, I've kind of skipped over it because I, I didn't really know what to make of it. As I was reading it this time and, and took a few days to meditate on these passages and, and think them through, God brought to my mind a memory. And it's one of the very earliest memories I have of being in church. Now, I have other foggy memories that probably go earlier, but this one's very clear, and I remember the whole story. And I want to share that with you today because I think God gave it to me to help me understand this passage. I don't know how old I was, but what I do remember is that that we were in the basement of the church, and my friend and I, we were waiting for the uh, refreshments to come out of the kitchen. And the church was a typical 70s, 80s uh, church basement that had the kitchen kind of closed off. And then uh, the ladies inside the kitchen could open this uh, kind of kind of doorway or, or cupboard kind of thing. And then the counter from inside the kitchen stretched right out into the fellowship hall, and they could just push the, the goodies and food and stuff out through that, through that window. And so we were waiting for that window to open. Uh, when it opened, the first thing that the ladies inside did is they pushed out this big, uh, this big jug of juice with a little tap on it. And my friend and I, of course, being being little guys, we'd we'd been running around and we're sweaty and hot and thirsty. So we were so we got our cups right away and we filled them up. And we took a sip. And I remember this clearly. We were facing each other, and we were both taking a drink at the same time. And as we sipped, we both brought the cup down and made a a horrible face and felt that shiver go down our back. And we looked at her and said, this juice is horrible. And uh, we we could see in the kitchen, and we could see that there was another jug. It was glass and it had a tap. And we could see that the color of the juice was a different color. So it was obviously much better than the juice that was had been pushed forward. And so we asked the ladies in the kitchen, can we have that juice instead of this juice? And they said, no. They said, we're going to finish this jug first, and if it's empty, then we'll put the other one out. And so my friend and I, we, we thought about that, and we really wanted that other juice. It looked so much better. And so we decided what we were going to do is we were going to get to that juice. And so we, we guzzled our cups, and then we filled them again, and we guzzled them, and then we filled them again. 
We tried to empty that jug so we could get to the good stuff. Well, before you know it, our, our stomachs were out to here and tight and, and right full of liquid. And, and I, we were shivering a little bit because we, are, we were so full from the inside of this ice cold drink. And we still hadn't succeeded in emptying the jug and getting to the other one. Now, what's really interesting about this memory is that I remember another part, a deeper part, quite clearly, because my friend and I talked about this. I remember that in our, in our little minds, our immature minds, we had this idea that we were doing a service for the rest of the people. Nobody wanted that awful juice, but if we just suffered through drinking it, then everyone else would get to have the good juice, including ourselves. Well, our ambition was greater than our ability. We didn't make it, and before that ju jug of juice was empty, uh, we were so full we couldn't enjoy any of the cookies and brownies that were now being pushed out across the counter, and we just went back to the table and just kind of sat there and couldn't really do anything because we were so uh, so full of juice. But it's interesting to me that even at that young age, without any any real training, I, I kind of intuitively understood what I want to talk about here today. You know, in some ways, things haven't changed all that much, because even till today, I'll, I'll sometimes take a cupcake and turn it on its side, cut the bottom off, and eat the, the crumbly dry bottom so I can have that beautiful top half of the, of, the, of the cupcake with the proper cake to icing ratio. Or I'll take a sandwich, and I'll eat off the dry crust so that I can, I can end up with that beautiful balanced flavor and textures of the middle of the sandwich where everything's perfect. And so I'll make those kind of small sacrifices uh, just, just for the sake, of, for, for the sake of, of, of getting something better. So now with those things in mind, let's turn our attention to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my physical body for the sake of his body, the church, what is still lacking in the sufferings of Christ. I became a servant of the church according to the stewardship from God, given to me for you, in order to complete the word of God, that is, the mystery that has been kept hidden from ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known to them the glorious riches of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him by instructing and teaching all people with all wisdom, so that we may present every person mature in Christ. Toward this goal I also labor, struggling according to his power that powerfully works in me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those in Laodicea, and for those who have not met me face to face. My goal is that their hearts, having me knit together in love, will be encouraged, and that they may have all the riches that assurance brings in their understanding of the knowledge of the mystery of God, namely, Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will, be, will deceive you through arguments that sound reasonable. For though I am absent with you, from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your, your moral morale and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Let us pray. Our God who is in heaven, open your word to us today that we might understand it, not just in our minds, but in our hearts, and even more importantly, in our actions as we seek to follow you. Amen. You know, as I've, as I've read these verses in Colossians chapter 1 and 2, I'm not going to take the time to go through all the different things that we could learn from these passages. I just want to make note of one observation, I think an important observation, and then share some thoughts around that observation. You see, there seems to be a connection being made in this passage between suffering and love. That first verse I read is quite challenging. I rejoice in what I suffer for you. I, I don't know very many people that rejoice in suffering. It seems almost wrong, but because it's in the Bible, I can't quite say it's wrong. But I re rejoice in what I'm suffering for you and fill up in my flesh 
what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, as Paul writes then through the next verses, he talks about the struggle that he has or that he's going through, the way he's, he's, uh, he's moving forward to present Christ to all people, uh, especially the Gentiles. And then he brings that to the conclusion. He says, my goal is, so the goal for all of this work I'm doing, this suffering, this struggling, my goal is this, that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches and complete understanding and know the mystery of God, namely Christ. So there's several things in there that Paul is aiming at. His goal is in all this struggle and suffering for the church. But one of them is that they would be united in love. And we know from God's word that, that people will know about Christ's love when they see it in the church. And so the reason for his struggling, the reason he would choose to suffer and rejoice in suffering is because he understands what the outcome is, what he expects to be the outcome, which is that the church will be united in love. Now, this is something that I think you already know. I knew it at a young age in the church basement. But we just need to be reminded of it. So let's, let's take, a, take a look at what we already know. You remember the sandwich. Uh, of course... We could, uh, we've all probably done something like that where we, we eat something that we don't like to get at the bit that we like better, cut the cupcake in half and stuff like that. But we can think of even more important things. So if, you, if we go back in, in memory just to this past winter, uh, there was a period of time where it was minus 30, minus 40 for a week. And every single day, sometimes twice a day, my wife or I, usually not both of us, would bundle up. We'd put on our, our boots and our coats and put our scarves around and pull our hats down low on our gloves and go outside. Uh, it wasn't usually for very long, but we did that. And, and why do you think we did that? Well, we suffered the cold because we love our dog. And our dog wanted to, needed to go for a walk. Now, those walks weren't very long when it was that cold, but we still did all the work of bundling up and going out uh, in the evening before night in order to, uh, to, 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 to ser give service to the dog that we love. Now, let me give you another example. This one uh, will make a lot of sense to some of you, and, and maybe to others you just don't have these same kind of desires, but let me ask you this question. If I could give you... Uh, a, a bank account, money is no object, and out of there you could buy any motor vehicle you want. What would you pick? Of all the things, of all the vehicles, custom, uh, factory, whatever, that are out there, what would you pick? Well, I know what I'd pick. I can, I can answer that question just in seconds after, you, after I ask it. I would pick a 1963 Corvette convertible. Now, I've never bought a Corvette convertible, but that's what my desire is. I'm not particularly rich, but if I really uh, made that my goal, I would, I'm sure I could have saved up the money over the years and have achieved that. But I never have done that. But maybe you'd ask me and said, well, what, what did you buy? Well, over the course of those years when I could have been savoring for a Corvette, but I didn't, I bought five minivans. So why would I sacrifice the vehicle that I truly desire and buy something I don't even like five times? Well, I think you know the reason. It's because I love my wife and children. And I want them to be safe and I want them to be comfortable. So I sacrifice my desire in order to love them. Maybe sometimes in your church you have an offering plate that goes around. I hope you put money in. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But why would people, good people who, who work hard for their money and have goals and aspirations for what they're going to do with their money, why would they put money in the offering plate at the church? Why would you do that? Well, it's because you love your church. You love the people. You love your pastor. You want to support the work. You want to contribute to the salary of your pastor and it should come out of love, and I expect it does for you. So we've come to the understanding, just through our, our common practice, 
that what it really means when we say I love you, if we're going to put it into practice, is that we, we give up something that I desire for the sake of another. We kind of intuitively know that. We're maybe not all that good at it, but we know it. And so this is sometimes what we do. But when we look at the Gospels, when we look at the words of Jesus Christ, we, we realize that it's, it's, it's quite easy to do these simple things. Maybe they don't seem simple at the time, but there's a reasonable expectation of a return. If I, if I love my wife and children properly through buying minivans and many other acts of love, they will almost certainly love me in return. There will be a reward for that. Well, let's see what Jesus says on this topic. Mark chapter 12, verse 31, the second command is this. Now, let's think about the first command. The first command is love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment greater than these. Of course, we know who our neighbor is by the parable that Jesus teaches. And the parable is simply the story of the Good Samaritan. This Good Samaritan is the one who got off his donkey when he saw the injured traveler by the road. And this was the most dangerous part of the road. Of course, if someone else had been robbed here, it means that the police from the previous town never get up here, and the police from the next town never get up here. This is the most dangerous section of the road. The others walked by and did not help. But the Samaritan got off his donkey, tended to the wounds, put the stranger on his donkey and walked to the next town, and then, and then put the, the wounded man into the care of the innkeeper with a blank check. Do whatever is necessary to bring him back to health, and I'll pay you the full amount when I get back. Never expecting a reward, because the expectation is that the wounded traveler would be back on his feet and back on his way before the Good Samaritan returns. Love your neighbor as yourself. But Jesus goes even further than that. Mark chapter 5, verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, it's one thing to sacrifice or give up something for my children. Even for my church, people that I know, people that I, that I love. It's a little more difficult when we define neighbors as even strangers hurt by the road. I can picture myself doing that sometimes, not every time. But enemies, enemies. It's another thing to love someone who does not like me, let alone love me, someone who hates me. That's a different thing. The reward will not come. Now, there might be some small reward in thinking I'm a good person, but, but that doesn't make up for the sacrifices necessary to practice this kind of love. You and I know this. You and I know that this is what the Bible teaches, what Jesus tells us how we should love. But we fail. I don't think it's a stretch for me to look every one of you in the eye and say, I know. You fail at this. I know I fail at this. And this, too, should come as no surprise. We want to love God adequately. But we are not capable of adequate sacrifice for pure love. The very first people to truly love Jesus Christ were the disciples. And yet we have the, the, re, the recording in Mark chapter 14, these words. Peter declared in verse 29, Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same thing. And I, I, th I, think, 
think I might include myself. Maybe you could include yourself in all the others. We hear per Peter's words, Jesus, I will love you. I will die for you. I'll never disown you. And all the others, all of us repeated the refrain, I will too. This is our commitment. And yet, just a few verses later, in the same chapter, Mark chapter 14, verse 50, we read these simple words, Then everyone deserted him and fled. Now, Peter hung on a little bit longer. In verse 72, Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. The first people who loved Jesus were not capable of making that sacrifice when the time came. Only Jesus is able to make the adequate sacrifice to love purely and completely without fail. Only Jesus. Now, I know the, the work that Jesus does on the cross, uh, sacrificing for our sins, has, has many aspects and many, many meanings and many, many ways in which uh, we've interacted with it. The, the, the uh, forgiveness of our sins and taking upon himself and, and suffering on our behalf and that him who is without sin and, 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 uh, and all of those things, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, all of those things. But it also means this. Jesus loved us. And that is proven. That is shown. That is expressed. It, don't, it has become real instead of just an emotion that doesn't have much reality. It's become real when he sacrificed. This is love. And I, I don't think, you know, I, I'm not making this up. We're, we're told this directly in God's word. If we, uh, if we look at the, the next, um, next verse I have here, 1 John chapter 4, one of the ones that was in that room when they made that commitment and then later ran away was John. And John writes this later in his letter. This is love. Now, let's just pause with those three words because they're so important. Can you imagine the, the God of the universe is now about to tell us what love is? People around the world are constantly seeking to understand what love is. There's songs about it. I want to know what love is. There's movies about it. There's, there's, there's uh, discussions. There's, it just consumes us, this idea of, of what is love? Is it love to discipline? Is it love to not? Is it love to... We go on and on, the, the discussions around the world, it, it, it almost drives the world, this question, what is love? And now the one who made all is going to tell us. I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. I really want to know, what does God say love is? What does God's word say? This is love. And the definition that's given begins with, with the negative, telling us what is not love, how we should not define love. This is what I've just been talking about for the last minutes. Not that we loved God. Don't define love by what I'm capable of. Don't define love by what you're capable of doing. If love is divine, defined by how you can love God, well then look at what we just read. They disowned him. They deserted him. They fled. They weren't capable of making the sacrifice to show real love. No, no, that, that's inadequate. If that's how love is defined, this indeed is a cruel world. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as atoning sacrifice for our sins. God's Word defines love as sacrifice. The sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross. That's what love is. Love is defined by what Jesus does, by what Jesus did. Love is defined by the cross. Love is defined by suffering. And then, just one verse later, 
the next verse. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We are called to the same love as our Savior. I think we can understand this verse where we started now. Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. It's not that Jesus, that his sacrifice was inadequate. That's not what this is about. It's telling us, what Paul is telling us, is that the world around us, the people around us, including those in a church, including those in our families, including those in our neighborhood, they'll never know what love is unless we love as Jesus loved. And Jesus' love is defined by sacrifice. So I suffer, I give up what I desire for the sake of others in order that Jesus Christ and his love, which is greater than mine, can be made known. And the re this is good news for exactly the reason that we just talked about. You see, what happens? What happens when we love one another in the church? What happens when we give up, when I give up what I desire for your sake, and you give up what you desire for the next person's sake, and we do this throughout the church, throughout the body of Christ? What happens? And that's verse 2 of Colossians chapter 2. My goal is that they, that they may be encouraged in heart, that is the people in the church, that they may be encouraged in heart and united in, in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. That's what happens when we love one another when we join Paul in saying, I rejoice in what I am suffering for your sake. Because my goal is that Jesus would be known among us and that we might be united in love. But it is challenging. It is difficult. And we need to ask ourselves hard questions to reach this, this reward of unity in Christ. So I ask you two questions in closing. Where have I fallen short because I was unwilling to sacrifice my desire? Now this question is looking back. What, what, when have I failed in this? Now, I, I'm sure we can all think of many, many times, but I trust that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now and, and showing you just one or two times, one or two or three times, that you could maybe go back and make that right. Obviously, there's, there's situations where, where I've failed in this, where I just have to seek confession, say, Lord, forgive me, for I have not loved as I should have, as I, as I could have, as I knew I was supposed to, but I didn't. But sometimes we can go back and put it straight. The more important question is this one. What is God calling me to suffer in order to love another? I suspect many of you have something in your mind right now. Something that you, you kind of know, you've known for a while. I'm supposed to give that up. I'm supposed to put aside my desire so I can more, so I can more completely or, or better show love to someone. But it's been a struggle. Just look at Jesus, what he was willing to give up, what he was willing to suffer for you, to love you properly. I think that will make it easier. What is God calling me to suffer in order to love another today? Let's pray. Lord, we are inspired by the example of your Son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I pray, God, that if there's anyone listening 
that has not accepted and received that life, that they would reach out to their pastor or friend or someone and say, could you help me receive this love from God? Lord, put before us the vision of what you can do, of what you will do when we love one another. The beauty of the unity of your church that will make known your Son to everyone. And then with that hope of glory before us, show us how we can love one another the way you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.